Spider-Man Remastered is a model game on the Steam Deck. It gets virtually everything right. And sure, people are talking about how well it performs, but not so many people are talking about what else it does right. As it stands, this game could be a new standard for what's possible if you embrace Steam and Steam Deck as a platform. That's just one of two stories I have for killer features that are on the Steam Deck that no one else is talking about. So let's get into it. What's good, Deck Gang? As we get started, don't forget to like and subscribe since that really helps this channel grow. This is a bit of a makeup episode, so there's a lot to get through. Today, we're going to talk about a new killer feature, PlayStation PC, the fix to recent performance issues on the Steam Deck, as well as Valve's response to stolen Steam Decks, not to mention the evidence that they're gearing up for a launch of the Deckard. Maybe. All that plus a whole load of great games, but before all that, we need to talk about Spider-Man Remastered. Spider-Man Remastered launched last week on Steam, and as expected, it did incredibly well. It made the number two and number three spot of the Steam top sellers that week. That means that both the pre-orders and the post-launch sales did well enough to both be the top selling game of the week. Then once again, it made the number two spot this past week. As expected, many people started playing immediately with over 65,000 concurrent players over that weekend. That doesn't quite match God of War's feat of 73,000 concurrent players, but it comes damn close. Furthermore, there was a lot of excitement around how well it plays on Steam Deck. Game Explained, GameSpot, RPS, SkillUp, ETA Prime, and IGN all did a version of how does Spider-Man look and play on the Steam Deck? And yeah, it plays great. Here's how my play experience went. I'll keep this brief since there are so many videos covering this, but I'll also use this as an opportunity to go a little deeper than most of those videos covered. First of all, while I do think the game runs great out of the box, there was one setting I changed pretty quickly. Dynamic resolution scaling is enabled by default, and aside from some image quality concerns, I found the frame pacing with this option to be subpar. I figured the resolution doesn't adjust before the frame rate gets affected, so it kind of results in these big swings. That was pretty unpleasant. Actually, on that note, the dynamic resolution scaling will target a frame rate, but the only options are 30, 45, and 60, so you can't even target the beloved 40 FPS. So I'd say that's the first thing to change. I opted to set the FSR option to quality, and that worked out well for me. It's still going to draw between 20 and 25 watts of total power, so this is not the battery saver option. But with FSR quality, I got solid image quality and it stays close to 40 FPS in most scenarios. If you want to save battery life, however, you can set FSR to balanced and set the frame limiter to 30 and lower the TDP between 8 and 12 depending on how much you care about the frame rate dips. Personally, like I said, I stuck to FSR quality with the 40 FPS cap. I didn't want to sacrifice any more image quality and I've always got power nearby. By the way, if you want a really good deep dive on what settings to use, I would actually recommend the latest video from The Deckverse. Timur goes through each setting in detail and gives his optimized golden 40 settings. But honestly, power and performance aren't really the thing I wanted to talk about with regard to Spider-Man Remastered on deck. I saw a precious few people talking about how well Spider-Man Remastered handles Steam input and the Steam input API. Thankfully, resident Dexpert, Mosquito, published a whole 20-minute video where he does a really in-depth Steam input review of Spider-Man. You heard me right. I called him a Dexpert. You like that? I just made it up. Don't forget to send me royalties if you make a YouTube channel with that name. In any case, check out his review if you haven't already, I'm going to put a link in the description. I'll cover some high points here because this game really goes to show why more developers should be incorporating better Steam input support. First of all, Gyro is pre-enabled. The sensitivity is already tuned well, so it's not jarring. If you played it on deck, you probably didn't even notice it was enabled by default. Also, because it uses the Steam input API, you can remap actual action. So if you go to the controller layout option inside of the settings menu, it's going to take you to the Steam overlay where you can remap buttons, but instead of remapping them to other buttons or keys, you have the option of selecting Spider-Man specific options like jump, dodge, attack, and web strike. There's a total of 12 actions you can map to any input method on the Steam Deck, and on top of that, the label will show up correctly in any of the in-game tooltips. Even further, most of the glyphs for external controllers are supported too, so this is a great experience when docked as well. 
I know that this is not like a glamorous feature to talk about, but it really goes a long way to exemplify the benefits of an open platform like PC because by supporting Steam input, you're effectively supporting a full suite of input methods that are available to users. It's the sort of thing that makes it easier for people to migrate from console gaming to PC gaming. My daughter is young and she's the type of person that's used to the Switch, so you can imagine that if she sees the prompt for an A button, she's going to press the B button every single time. By supporting Steam input, the game developers are meeting my daughter halfway and affording her an option to use the controller and input method she's used to, which is one of the many reasons we love PC gaming in the first place. It's official support for more options which consoles just don't have. To see a console company like Sony embrace this level of accessibility gives me hope that they're setting a standard for others to follow. For what it's worth, this isn't Sony's first foray into Steam input. When I spoke to Mosquito about the subject, he endorsed their work on Days Gone, but was less impressed with their support for Horizon Zero Dawn, and God of War doesn't use the Steam input API at all. So hopefully, even Sony sees this as a standard for themselves here. The downside to Steam input and Steam input API, of course, is that it's proprietary to Steam and only Steam games can use it. I'm aware that my audience only wants to play games on Steam and Steam only, and while I agree that the benefits vastly outweigh the drawbacks, I do think that that's a drawback and that it's worth mentioning. Moving on then from really heartwarming stuff about Spider-Man and Steam input, it's time to get into some good old PC gaming fuckery. That's right, I'm talking about Spider-Man mods. Cue the supercut. I haven't actually tried any Spider-Man mods, but over in our Fanda Deck Discord, someone posted a link to a video tutorial on how to mod this game on the Steam Deck, so it appears these should all work on deck. That's awesome. Of course, as is the standard for the launch of any big game on PC, data miners got busy quickly to see what goodies they could spelunk in the files of Spider-Man Remastered. As VGC have reported, Spider-Man's files contain references to things like PSN account linked and PSN linking entitlements, which indicates that PSN integration may be in the works for Sony's PC games. They later further found, in fact, that a launcher like that of Ubisoft and Rockstar may be in the works as well. A launcher does not equal a storefront, but that hasn't stopped rampant speculation about whether or not there will be a storefront in the works and whether or not Sony would eventually keep their games exclusive to their launcher or whether they would implement cross-buy. And then, after all the speculation, Sony went ahead and launched a new PlayStation Games for PC landing page on their official site. This landing page showcases their current PC titles including God of War, Spider-Man Remastered, and Horizon Zero Dawn. Notably, they say you can buy their games at a range of digital retailers, but all of this screen real estate here is dedicated specifically to Steam and the Epic Games Store, which we'll come back to later. After that, there's a section for frequently asked questions, and here there seem to be hints to some of the things that had been speculated up to this point. The first question asks, how much will PlayStation games on PC cost? And the answer here is extremely vague and just says pricing varies by title. There's a whole lot of discourse right now around $70 games on PC, and I'm wondering if their Last of Us remake will be a $70 title to match the PS5 price. My initial thought is that by staggering the PC launch, they can continue to price at $60 or lower on PC, which raises a question for me. Would you be willing to pay $70 for PS5 exclusives if we could get them on day one on PC? Comment down below with your answer. The next question in the FAQ alludes to the rumored launcher and it asks, do I need a PSN account to play PlayStation games on PC? This is the one that's gotten everyone's attention because the answer says, quote, no, you currently do not need a PSN account to enjoy PlayStation Studios games on PC. End quote. It sure seems like the word currently is pulling a lot of weight there. And in the next FAQ, they specify that DualSense support works for some titles, but only via a wired connection. And then we move on to another frequently asked question where it seems like the word currently is pulling a lot of weight again. This one is about cross buy and they answer, quote, the PC and console versions of PlayStation Studios games are different products. It is currently not possible to purchase the PC version of a title and then play it on a PS4 or PS5 console or vice versa, end quote. And that's how these answers go for trophy sync or save sync. They don't wanna to commit to anything, but they're leaving the door open for future functionality. The last thing of note that I'll point out here is the question of where can you buy your PC games? And the answer is, 
quote, PlayStation Studios titles on PC are available for purchase at a range of digital retailers including Steam and Epic Games, end quote. This sort of verbiage here is why some people think that Sony is very keen in keeping a good relationship with Valve and Epic. They're clearly giving these storefronts a lot of love on their PlayStation PC page, and it doesn't give the appearance that any of this would change anytime soon. I have a lot more complicated thoughts about whether or not Sony would do store exclusive games on PC, but I'd have to explore that in another video. For now, what do you see as the future of PlayStation on PC? Will we ever get day one release? Would cross buy, cross save, or trophy sync get you interested in the launcher, or are you more in the no launchers ever camp? Let me know in the comments below. With that, I want to move on to some recent Steam Deck software updates. There's been a lot that's happened lately, and rather than go through each update chronologically, I'm going to tell you about some of the big features, including one killer feature that no one's talking about. So first is a series of performance fixes. With the launch of SteamOS 3.3, I mentioned that there were a number of performance issues being reported on the Steam Deck. Notably, they included Red Dead Redemption 2 and Forza Horizon 5. Well, there's a patch that's made it all the way to the stable channel to address these specific titles. With RDR2, it seems that there was an updated VRAM behavior in 3.3 that was causing the issue, so Valve since reverted back to the workaround they were using prior to 3.3. With Forza, it's not clear to me what was causing the issue and how it was resolved. I know that since the launch of the Steam Deck, I was able to get 59 FPS consistently when running the benchmark tool on very low, but after the Forza 5 Hot Wheels DLC, I was getting 54 FPS. That may not sound like much, but that's nearly a 10% drop with no visible benefit. In any case, after the last update, it's now running at 56 FPS. So certainly still not what it was before, but also it's much better. Again, this could be just a case of the game being less performant now, regardless of the platform it's running on. There were other games that reported performance drops like Alan Wake and Horizon Zero Dawn, but I don't know if that was a placebo effect, nor do I know if these titles have been addressed in any way. In the meantime, it does appear that these two titles have improved performance with these updates to the latest SteamOS and Steam clients. Next up is offline mode. They've addressed a few issues with this, like the following. Fixed an issue where rebooting in Steam offline mode would cause games to fail to launch. Fixed the cloud sync error notification popping up when offline. And they disabled the Steam offline mode button when not connected to the internet, since trying to do this currently gets Steam Deck into a bad state. They noted that it doesn't actually affect your ability to play without a connection. What's really interesting here, though, is the opening note. They said, quote, we're continuing to look at making the user experience of playing games without an internet connection a better, more intuitive experience, end quote. There's been a lot of talk lately about how online-only DRM ruins the experience for the Steam Deck, which you know is intended to be a portable experience. And I worry that while there's a lot that Valve can do to improve the experience for their own client and operating system, that online-only DRM might be a hill that's too tough to climb for some really popular games. I wonder if Valve is doing the same sort of back-channel persuading that in the past they've tried to do with anti-cheat and general Linux compatibility before that. Hopefully the offline experience continues to get improved since that only benefits everyone with a Steam Deck. And finally, in the latest client beta hides the Steam Deck's killer feature and one that I think could make it so that I don't use trackpads in shooters almost ever again. You see, this update on August 17th is a big one and it includes some great additions like Joy-Con support, the ability to remove community layouts that you've uploaded in the past, and the ability to set resolution in non-Steam games. But buried among all that awesome stuff is this bullet point here, improved flickstick mode. So what is flickstick, you ask? Flickstick is a method of input that allows for much more accurate aiming than analog sticks. I would argue that it's even more accurate than trackpads. The difficulty in the past has been that it takes quite a bit of work to set up and calibrate. There are two games I know of that implemented Flickstick natively. Those are CSGO and Boomerang X. I never played CSGO with Flickstick, but my experience with Boomerang X was superb. So seeing that the generic functionality for Flickstick in the Steam client has been improved, that certainly piqued my curiosity. I wanted to see if it was something I could really use now and so far I have to say that it's great. You should know that it still takes elbow grease to calibrate it and if that turns you off you should stick with trackpads since those require very little calibration. 
but like using the paddle buttons or configuring an Xbox Elite control pad, if you're willing to put in some of that work, I think you'll be able to enjoy shooters at a whole new level. So let me tell you a little bit about how it works and then I'll show you how to use it. For your first time using this, I would recommend a simpler first person shooter, something like Quake, Turok, or the recent Fashion Police Squad should work quite well. The way it works is that you use the right analog stick for horizontal aiming only. The 360 degrees on this stick map to the 360 degrees of the horizontal screen space. So if you flick the stick down, you do an about face and are now aiming behind you. And if you sweep around the edge of the analog stick, you will similarly do a full turn in game. To get this right is where you'll need to do some tuning, but you can probably immediately see the benefit of flicking to aim behind you or to the left of you or whatever. Of course, that only covers horizontal aiming, so what about vertical aiming? Well, that's where gyro comes in. You'll need to enable gyro to do vertical aiming, and I would recommend tuning the vertical sensitivity higher than the general sensitivity. So let's go ahead and get into that. I'm only going to cover sort of the bare minimum here and I might make a fully dedicated video to this once it goes live in the stable channel. The first thing to do of course is to change the right joystick behavior to flick stick. Then the main thing to get right is the sensitivity or pixels per revolution. The description in here tells you everything you need to do which is perform a 360 degree sweep in the game. If your aim overshoots your starting direction, decrease this value. If you undershoot, increase it. So let's do that. I'm going to aim at something in the game like this light pole and do a full sweep. If I overshoot the light pole, I'll tune it down. And if I end up short of the light pole, I'll raise the value. Preferably make sure gyro is disabled for this calibration. Also make sure you're making big changes at first and then decreasing the delta each time. Once you feel like it's right or you're even just getting close, you're going to want to do multiple sweeps at once because if you're off just a little bit, these additional sweeps will accumulate and you can more easily see if you're consistently overshooting or undershooting. Once you're doing multiple sweeps and staying in the same 5 degree margin of error, you know you got it. For Fashion Police Squad, this was 4525 PPR for me. This was at a 6.3 in-game sensitivity, and your number is going to differ based on what your in-game sensitivity is. Once you have this set, you can see how the flicks work. Flick right or left and you turn 90 degrees. Flick down to about face. Finally, enable gyro since you'll need that vertical aiming. Here are my settings. Now there's some really neat advanced tuning that you can do, but I'm going to save that for a dedicated video. Let me know in the comments if you want to see that. Even with just this though, I'm loving this style of aiming. I'm still getting better at using it, but I feel faster and more accurate already. If I had to rank the methods of aiming, I'm going to put mouse and keyboard in the S tier. Flick stick and trackpad are both in the A tier, but I have flick stick higher within that tier. Then dual analog is way down in the D tier. So if you're up for it, give it a try and let me know if I helped show you something new. All right, so there are just a couple more miscellaneous tidbits and morsels in the Valve world recently. First, there are more hints that point to an upcoming launch of some new hardware, most likely the heavily rumored VR headset, the Deckard. Most importantly, Valve are looking to fill a position in supply chain program management. Sadly, it's Bradley caught this one and pointed out that the job listing said Valve are looking for the following, experience in product launch management and program management, experience in managing external partners and vendor relationships, as well as experience using QuickBooks and Steam VR stats. They've since removed the bit about Steam VR stats, but as you know, the internet never forgets. The fact that they're looking for someone with experience in product launch management definitely indicates that they're staffing up in preparations for another launch. If not for the hint about VR, there are a few things that it could be, like a Steam Controller 2 or even a retail launch of the Steam Deck. But given the note about Steam VR stats, I would expect that this has to do with the Deckard. And finally, there is some interesting development on what Valve is doing about stolen Steam Decks. If you look at the Steam Deck subreddit, there are plenty of reports on delivery personnel, perhaps stealing or mishandling Steam Decks, and that has concerned a lot of potential customers. Well, I don't know if this is related to delivery folks, but here's a post on the subreddit from user Kamauri. It's a screenshot from Steam Support, and it says, quote, Hello. The Steam Deck being used on this account has been reported stolen. Can you please let us know how you obtained it? If you purchased it online, can you let us know what platform it was listed on? eBay, Facebook Marketplace, etc. End quote. So yeah, looks like they're reaching out to folks that are using potentially stolen Steam Decks and investigating some more. We probably won't hear Valve talk about this, so we may never know what they actually do with this data, but I'll certainly let you know if I hear anything on this front. 
All right, before the community spotlight, it's time to talk about some amazing games that were announced or released. First, do you like Metal Gear Solid? Check this out. That game is called Covert Critter, and as you can see, you play as a lizard in an MGS-inspired stealth game. This game just got a Steam page, but there's also a free demo over on Itch.io. Looking forward to hearing more about this one. By the way, the music I played there is an unrelated synthwave cover of the MGS Encounter theme. Links to everything I just mentioned will be in the description below. I also played the demo for the upcoming strategy title, The Deal Field Chronicle. I gotta tell you, I am sold on this game. Like many others, I was surprised by the real-time nature. I was expecting more straight tactics. Instead, if you like Valkyria Chronicles, I think you're gonna like this. It plays great on Steam Deck, so go ahead and check out that demo. This has otherwise been a great couple of weeks for games. In addition to Spider-Man Remastered, I've been playing Cult of the Lamb, Roller Drome, and Fashion Police Squad. Cult of the Lamb plays as though Hades were given the Act Razor treatment. It has really well-made management gameplay in addition to the addictive roguelite aspects. I haven't decided if I'm sold on Roller Drome yet. There's no doubt that it's a well-executed game, and I love the style, but I'm not yet drawn in by the objectives or score chasing like I normally would be with this sort of game. If it does end up sinking its hooks into me though, I'll be sure to let you know. Fashion Police Squad is another one that's hard to give a full-fledged recommendation to. Just like Roller Drome, the production values and the aesthetic are amazing, but in this case, I found the encounter design to be tedious. There's a lot of weapon switching, but it doesn't feel purposeful like Doom Eternal. Instead, it feels rote. Still, I've been playing it quite a bit. The secrets are nice, and I've accepted the simple gameplay for what it is. I'd recommend trying the free demo and just seeing for yourself. And here are some other great looking games that have launched to really solid user reviews. Lost in Play, Arcade Paradise, Backpack Hero, Blossom Tales 2, Curse to Golf, and Neo Dash. This week we get a couple more big ones. Midnight Fight Express has been on my radar for some time and should be out by the time you're watching this video. And finally, Soul Hackers 2 is out on Thursday. This is another Shin Megami Tensei game and the early impressions are looking solid. Finally, let me give you today's community spotlight. If you like to use PlayStation Remote Play on your Steam Deck, then you're already familiar with the app Chiaki, and you might also know that you can't remote play outside your local network by default. Well, this user on Reddit who goes by dglavimans posted a really good write-up on how to get it working outside your local network using Chiaki. It involves port forwarding and utilizing a static IP, so it's not exactly simple, but it could be worth it if you want to remote play from anywhere in the world. As always, link is in the description, so check it out. Anyway, that is it for this week. Let me know what you think about today's topics. What do you think about Spider-Man Remastered on the Steam Deck or PlayStation PC? How are Valve's performance fixes treating you? Do you think you'll use Flickstick? Let me know in the comments. If you like this video, then like the video, and if you want more, be sure to subscribe. And if you're interested in helping out more than that, maybe join awesome folks like Emsher, Andrew P, and Lucas on my Patreon. That gang out. Goodbye.